Sullivan v. James Gilwendo at LCD 1407919. Well, let me have your entries again, please. Your Honor, Alex Krekka on behalf of James Gilwendo. And good morning, Judge Joseph Sullivan, a.k.a. DJ Coyote. Thank you. Request by Mr. Sullivan to place this on the record, and so we're recording it right now. Prior to placing it on the record, there was some discussion about dismissing all parties except Mr. Gilwendo as party defendants. The court has signed that order and will file it. And we're here today on a motion to dismiss for lack of standing. Your Honor, as you know, this is a 12B6 motion which would test the legal sufficiency of the complaint itself and whether the complaint fails to state a claim. As you know, my client was pro se and filed a motion to dismiss, asserting that Mr. Sullivan, the plaintiff, lacked standing to bring this case. Upon review of the complaint, there are three separate claims, legal claims that are brought. The first cause of action would be criminal damage to property. The second one is conversion. And the third one is prima facie tort. With respect to each of them, Your Honor, independently, they would require standing to assert those privileges. As you know, this case involves graffiti art or street art on a privately held piece of property, a commercial piece of property, of which Mr. Galindo, at the time, relevant to this case, was a tenant of part of the property. So, again, I'm not going to get into facts other than to give that bit of background. With respect to each of those claims, Your Honor, and the standing, the lack of standing thereof, there is no assertion within the complaint that Mr. Sullivan has any property rights to this piece of real property. There is no allegation that he owns the property. There is no allegation that he is a tenant of the property. And there is no allegation that he had a contractual right to paint the property. As you know, in New Mexico, there's a rule with respect to contract cases that if you have a contract, you attach the contract to the complaint. There is no contract attached to this complaint. Your Honor, I'd like to offer an analogy first. If you were a classic car buff, Your Honor, and you found a 1964 Mustang in a barn somewhere, and you saw that all it needed was a paint job to make it beautiful again, to restore it, and you took it to the world's best classic car painter, and that person said to you, Judge Cedillo, this car is one of my favorite cars. It would be my honor to paint it any color you like, beautiful color, and put it on the road, because I think the world needs to see this car. It's a piece of art, and I'll do it for you for free. The paint shop owner doesn't own the car. You own the car, Judge. And if your car gets keyed in a parking lot, does that mean that the paint shop owner has a right to sue whoever keyed your car? No, Your Honor, you do. You own the car. There's no ownership interest in this property which has been painted, and there's been no allegations of it. Furthermore, there's no allegations of a violation of a statute or ordinance or any law that would give Mr. Sullivan standing to assert the claims that he's asserted in his lawsuit. And the last thing I'll say, Your Honor, is that if this complaint were allowed to go forward, it creates a dangerous precedent in that I believe what Mr. Sullivan is asking, based upon my reading of the complaint, is that all graffiti artists could then start bringing lawsuits against people who cover up their graffiti art. So does that mean if the city, as part of its abatement program, comes to my office and covers graffiti art, that a cause of action now exists for the graffiti artist to turn around and sue the city because they covered up a piece of art on my property? 
the city doesn't have standing because the city doesn't own my property, but they have an abatement program. In fact, my office got tagged not that long ago, and I called the city, and they came out, and they took care of it. They painted over it. So, Your Honor, my argument is simply there is no ownership interest. There is no standing in this case, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. You know, I just want to take a moment to um, just discuss the brief, brief, brief history of, of graffiti uh, in general, because it wasn't always an accepted art form. And I, I just want to be clear that today, um, graffiti art and street art are a well-respected and, and highly sought after form of art. Uh, across the world. Um, although the art form itself began in Philadelphia in New York in the late 60s and early 70s by children, um, it has since evolved um, to become a very dynamic art form and an art form that was actually sought out by people such as the defendant, uh, James Galindo in this case. Um, nowadays, there are celebrations of the art form, such as the uh, Winwood Walls in Miami that takes place every year, where artists come from all over the world to uh, paint murals. Um, there are now street artists who are millionaires, where there's movies done about them and books written about them. Um, the goal in this case is to somewhat test the waters and see what the Metropolitan Court is, is willing to accept as a uh, either criminal damage or a prima facie tort. I, I certainly under, understand and respect uh, defendant's motion and I do stipulate that I do not own the wall that was painted and I was never be irrelevant whether I was a tenant or not of, of the building itself. Um, in May, March of 2019, myself and a friend from Los Angeles painted a mural in the north facing alleyway near Aliso and Central. And I have a just a Google map and I'll present this to the court um, and I, I have shown it to the uh, Mr. Krisha, um, just to show what, because this whole area is covered with murals. To begin with, the wall in question is in an alleyway that I have had ongoing and continuous permission to paint at my leisure, both subject matter, time, date, since 2008. The owner of the property, Milton Baca, or, or Sat Baca as he is also known, um, simply asked if I wanted to paint that wall in 2007. I've painted it, and I've disclosed those photos to the um, defense, defense uh, at least five or six times since 2008. Um, painting the complete, complete wall uh, in a graffiti street art style fashion. Um, this building, all of it is owned by Milton Baca. Um, I think parties have stipulated to that. 
the, the building is divided. Although it's one building, it's cordoned off into three different zones. zero one as point monster did exhibit one may approach so the the single building structure has three different areas cordoned off each of them are rented by different folks my information and belief is that Mr. Galindo had rented the space at 3901 Central which is the largest space of all of them. The 108 Aliso address was vacant and that is where the mural in question res still resides up until today. The mural itself was vision of mine that encompasses some 25 years of experience with the art form. It is unique to, to my form and style and it was created using my own tools which would be spray cans, ladders, spray caps, and time. The mural was created in March of 2019 over the course of about three days. That was where I first met Mr. Galindo and he stated I'm renting the space up around the corner. He introduced himself, said he was a big fan of graffiti and or street art um, and liked what we were doing. He took pictures of us. Um, the mural stood untouched for quite some time until I got a text from Mr. Galindo that he wished to cover up the entire mural to which I objected, which is stated in the complaint. Um, then what happened was unusual. in that he painted a large kind of blobby square over the mural and wrote the words luxury my ass which he has stipulated too um, he has also stipulated that I had permission to paint the wall as of 2008 and he was aware of that prior to painting a, a big blob 
stating luxury my ass over the mural. I'm marking three photographs as plaintiffs exhibit two, three, and four. timeline of the the events in regards to the mural. Plaintiff's Exhibit 2 is a photo I took when the mural was first completed back in March. Plaintiff's Exhibit 3 shows the mark, the luxury of my ass that Mr. Galindo has already admitted to placing over the mural. And then Plaintiff's Exhibit 4 is um, after Mr. Galindo was evicted from the space, I was actually able to go fix the mural at um, honestly very little cost. Um, I went to my garage in preparing to fix a mural, do another mural, something, and I actually found the bag with the exact spray cans I had used. Um, and so I was able to take the same colors, do some color matching, and really fix the mural with not a lot of effort, nor time, nor expense. to mark a few more photographs that just so, show the sequence of my repairing the mural at my own expense. not at the request of property over owner Milton Baca. He had not taken any steps to fix any part of the mural after Mr. Galindo had marked it up. Um, I th and I, as I recall, I think it was about a month and a half. I could be wrong on that, but I think it it had that blob on it for about a month and a half. I, again, I could be wrong. But once he was evicted, um, Mr. Baca did not request I go fix anything. I simply took it upon myself um, to go over there, uh, repair the mural. I, I think it took me about two hours. Um, again, very little cost. Um, and that was in an effort to, to mitigate expenses as much as possible. So the plaintiffs is requesting that this court, as has happened um, in other uh, cases, where actually have a case and it was disclosed to the defendant, where the city of Albuquerque did paint over a mural we had almost identically in an alleyway. Um, and that lawsuit took place in the Burnley County District Court. Um, we did sue in that case. Um, it, it didn't go to trial, therefore there are no findings of fact or, or conclusions of law, but there was a, was a settlement in the case. It, it, it's incorrect and misleading for the defendant to state that every tagger is now going to have a platform to uh, sue the city of Albuquerque uh, if they paint over their, their 
illegal graffiti. The difference in this case is this is something that was um, desired by the landowner, accepted by the community for, well, since 2008, um, and it was done with permission. The act of Mr. Galindo was not done with permission. He did one, he did not have a tenancy right in that space at 108 Aliso. Two, if he did, that doesn't mean that he had any right to paint over that mural regardless. There's never been any sort of lease agreement or documentation provided from the defendant and Mr. Galindo had any sort of permission to paint over that through any sort of tenancy right or just a permission right from the owner. As the artist, I do own, in this case, I do own the mural. That the paint applied to the wall was my own, which I paid for. The design was my own. And subject to administration from the landowner, certainly he could state, look, I got to paint over this for whatever reason. I think I would, I, obviously I would have to acknowledge that. But other than at his will, whether it was Mr. Galindo, whether it was the city of Albuquerque, or whether it's just some person walking on the street with a marker or a spray can or a can of buff paint in their hand, and they defaced the mural, I have standing to bring the three causes of action that were brought here. If Mr. Baca had sued, certainly defendant expenses go way up, but then the argument would be, well, Mr. Baca didn't create the mural, and all he's going to do is have to pay Mr. Sullivan to repair it or redo it. But he didn't own any portion of the mural. The mural was subject to, to my own discretion as to when it was painted, the times, and even the, the content, subject to only uh, obscenity uh, regulations, statutes, case law. There is a, a physical application of paint on the wall. The wall is merely a canvas. There was no actual damage to the wall from Mr. Galindo. I mean, he did not kick a hole in the wall. He did not, uh, you know, mark the wall in such a way that it, that it actually scratched the, the physical composition of the, the brick underneath. He applied a paint layer on top of my paint layer, which needed to be fixed. And that fix could only be done by me. Had it been done by anyone else, they would have had to completely erase the entire mirror because there's no one with the skill to apply the paint or the no knowledge to apply the paint in the way that I had applied it. The goal here is to have the courts acknowledge in, in Metro Court that there is inherent value in public art and just like the Visual Artist Rights Act has already discerned in, in the federal system, by statute, granted, that public art has value, artistic merit per individual has value. There have been several lawsuits uh, very recent lawsuits where you know multi-million dollar judgments were granted on spaces where uh, private individuals had it against advice covered over murals in say New York City um, graffiti murals and there's been judgments against advertisers who without the permission of the graffiti artist take pictures use use those photos in their advertisements. Um, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars at play. And I am not asking for anything remote 
to that, I've tried to mitigate down as much as humanly possible. There was a time when graffiti artists, as kids, settled these differences outside of court, outside of the law, whether it was fights uh, or worse. And I want to be able to show people that there's a different way, there's a different remedy now available. Here are the steps. You can do this yourself. You don't need an attorney. You don't need to go to federal court where it costs $400 to even file a case. And here's how you do it. If you can prove these steps, you may have a cause of action and you don't have to, which did happen in this case. Another individual that Mr. Galindo had painted over his piece, that gentleman went over and confronted Mr. Galindo and Mr. Galindo ended up calling the police and accusing that individual of assault. I'm trying to give folks a different way to handle these situations. Um, and so, Your Honor, I'm asking the court deny defendant's motion uh, regarding standing and uh, set this matter for a uh, full hearing. And lastly, if I may uh, move the profit exhibits into uh, the record, Your Honor. They're all de demonstrative, demonstrative at this point. We're not accepting evidence. This is just a motion to dismiss. Okay. And so they're, they're helpful to understand the uh, full picture, ex excuse the pun, but uh, uh, they're, they're not being accepted as evidence at this particular point. Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, if I may have just a couple of minutes. Um, I think you just hit the nail on the head. We're here on a 12B6, not here to argue facts or um, the merits of street art. I'm simply looking at the four corners of the complaint, which the court is required to do as a gatekeeper to determine whether this lawsuit should proceed forward. And quite simply, I think uh, Mr. Sullivan, the plaintiff, hit the nail on the head when he said that the landowner isn't here filing this lawsuit. The person who actually owns the building, who owns a piece of a real property. And that's the person that has the actual standing, if any, to bring this case. Um, I'm certainly not arguing any of his points of damages. Those are factual. We're just simply here to say the complaint has been brought by the wrong person. Mr. Sullivan does not have standing. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I ask you? Sure. So there's no dispute that uh, Mr. Sullivan is, is not the owner of the building. Uh, there's a factual issue that, that he raised as to whether or not he had permission from the owner of the building to perform the, uh, the artwork. Uh, what about the ownership of the art? Does he not own the art even if he does not own the building? He's put this art in the public purview, so anyone could come along and deface it. There could have been a stranger who would have never been known that could have come along and defaced it. It's not like it's hanging in an art gallery or a museum. Um, so I, My question, doesn't he own the art? I think he... I think he did until he put it on someone else's property. So this, this being my point, Your Honor, if I purchased his art, then I own his art. I've paid him for his time and his work and his expertise and his skills. Um, this is almost like a gift when you put it on someone's building. Um, it is subject to decay from the weather. It is subject to acts of God. It is subject to random acts of other violence. I mean, Mr. Sullivan himself today said that back in the day that graffiti artists would just fight <laughs> over these types of things. And so I certainly appreciate his skill and the time that he took to do this, but um, he doesn't have a contract that says, hey, I'm going to paint this on your building, but I still own this piece of art. He doesn't have that. He doesn't. So, Your Honor, and, and there's no stated cause of action under New Mexico law. I, in, in my argument, I said I, there's no asserted allegation of a violation of an ordinance or a violation of a rule or a regulation or a statute. And there's certainly no case law that is 
uh, at least identified or elements that would be identified to meet the very question that you have. There's no allegation of that. So if it exists, I'm not aware of it. I did some research in New Mexico. I couldn't find anything. Thank you, Rob. Mr. Sullivan, let me ask you something uh, similar to that. Um, who owned the art when you put it on someone else's building? I do. By operation of law, under what, under what circumstances? Because in this particular situation, uh, your your position is that you have the permission of the owner of the building. Uh, when you put it, uh, when you put your artwork on his canvas, how do you then differentiate between the paint and the canvas itself? I mean, how how does it become? your artwork and at least not in part the owner's artwork the owner of the building's artwork in, in a lot of cases it, it would because many times someone will approach an artist whether it's me or anyone else and say this is what I want on my wall and when you do that I think you not certainly not a, a, a written agreement but it would be an understanding because the person who owns the building requested a certain image or, or whatever it might be, certain colors. Uh, even if they requested a certain um, ambiance. In, in this case, this is something that I had free range over. This was essentially my canvas to do with as I saw fit subject to only the owner not subject to Mr. Galindo not subject to anyone simply walking down the street I think if the land owner if Mr. Baca had done exactly what Mr. Galindo did I don't have a cause of action that's his building he can do with it as he sees fit but in the you know in, in the food chain it, it's Mr. Baca me and then anyone else who defaces or touches that mural, I, I would have a cause of action if I could figure out who it was, or if they just simply admitted to it. Because there, there were times where things did get written on in that alleyway. What about Mr. Krekka's position that uh, when you make it part of the public domain, that you no longer uh, rec uh, retain any type of ownership to it? That, that's, I mean, it, when, when I walk out in the public domain, I'm not a, abandoning my, my own self-integrity. If I leave my car out on the street, if I leave my car in that alleyway, I'm not abandoning the integrity of, of any of that property. No, and for most property, you're correct. Uh, this is unusual property. Right? This is different uh, because it's intended for public view. Uh, there's no way you can ever take it with you. Uh, you're not going to be able to hang it on your wall unless you make some sort of really significant arrangement with the owner of the building. Well, so so uh, his his argument uh, is interesting because it basically uh, describes for this particular piece of property what happens uh, after the artwork is completed. So I'm just. I'm just curious about uh, how you see that. It, it seems they're arguing that it, it, it's abandoned. Which in, in this particular circumstance, it never was. And Mr. Galindo knew it. He knew how long I had been painting there. And he was there when we actually executed this particular mural. So he was fully aware of the circumstances around the mural and who had permission, who granted the permission. Knowing that, he still did what he did. And had someone done that by mistake, had the city painted over it by mistake, it, I think it 
tends to a different analysis. But in this case, Mr. Galindo's acts were intentional and unlawful. Um, and that rises to the cause, the cause of action, uh, the three cause of action that, that we have brought. Thank you, Judge. It's a very interesting case. Um, We're only here on a, on a motion to dismiss and to make a determination as to whether or not uh, Mr. Sullivan has standing to bring the lawsuit to begin with. Well, it might be some dispute as to whether or not he had permission uh, to create the art. Uh, his, his allegation, his position is that the owner of the building uh, allowed him to do so. As a result, uh, I think it overcomes that threshold. I think there still is an issue as to what happens with this type of art and this type of setting. Does the artist uh, maintain an ownership interest in it, uh, even though the canvas uh, it isn't his? Uh, I think I think there's some at least argument that can be made that for this particular type of art, uh, that it, it is transformed uh, because, and it may come down to the expectation of ownership. Who knows, it may come down to whatever the statutes or case law, and I'm not familiar with uh, all the statutes or case law related to this type of art. Uh, it may come down to uh, some sort of definition of ownership But I think I think at a at a minimum, uh, the lawsuit uh, can move forward. I think Mr. Sullivan does have standing. That being said, you all know that this is a court of limited jurisdiction. Uh, the law defines what we can and cannot do. In these types of situations. The, the only judgment that I can award would be a monetary judgment. We don't have injunctive authority. Uh, we do not have uh, the right to enter in time any kind of declaratory judgment. And I'm not sure that, that the parties will be able to get uh, all that they would like uh, because we are limited in those respects. Uh, I'm not sure you'll get full relief under the circumstances. Given the allegations being made thus far, uh, I'm not sure that monetary relief would satisfy anybody. And especially without injunctive authority or, or uh, declaratory authority, uh, I think that's really what the parties are looking for uh, in terms of who has what rights, uh, who can do what things, who can't do certain things. Uh, the court can enter findings with regard to many of those issues, but ultimately it doesn't stop any of the parties uh, after they leave our courthouse to continue the behavior. So I'm not sure that that we're the, uh, the right court because there are so many other things I think that you all would like to accomplish, and we certainly and we, we simply just don't have the authority to do those types of things. A lot of other interesting issues. Um, again, having to do with ownership, you know, I. I can see Mr. Kreka's uh, argument that if someone tags a building, that the owner of the building uh, might have some difficulty uh, painting over the tag. And why is that tag any less artful than the work being done by Mr. Sullivan? Uh, albeit, uh, it's 
Mr. Sullivan has some unique abilities and skills, and uh, uh, depending on your taste, um, can be considered an artist. I mean, there's, I, I don't, from what I see, it's, you know, it's, it's very entertaining, and that's all really art is. It, it certainly requires some skill, and that's part of art too. But who's to say that somebody that tags a building, a building with, uh, you know, the number 13 on it, uh, can't argue that that's also art. It's a different kind of art, but it's still art. And as a result, your your uh, corner of the building is the boundary line between uh, two gangs. Interesting uh, that we would get to that point. Uh, so I think, you know, that this case might be the case where uh, it ultimately goes up, it's appealed, and then there will be some decision by an appellate court, the Supreme Court perhaps, as to what kind of authority uh, this court does have with regard to these types of cases, if we have any at all. Um, there's also an interesting point that, that wasn't brought up, but uh, if along the discussion that we just had with regard to tagging a building. Uh, if, in fact, Mr. Galindo has been placing uh, the information that says luxury my ass or 50% off sale, how is that not art? How is that not graffiti? And how is he not protected? And so then you have a cycle because if what we know is graffiti is usually uh, without the permission of the owners of the property. And if the graffiti without the permission of the owners of the property is protected, then certainly Mr. Sullivan's artwork would have been protected. But then Mr. Galindo's artwork would have been protected. And then when Mr. Sullivan uh, defaced Mr. Galindo's artwork, and Mr. Galindo went back out and defaced Mr. Sullivan's artwork. And then Mr. Sullivan went back out and defaced Mr. Galindo's artwork. If all of this, if, if it's all protected, whether with or without the permission of the owner, then where do we end? Uh, the last person to run out of paint. You know, and I think then that uh, you all don't get the, the full relief that either of you are looking for. Uh, in this court, I certainly have no problem entertaining the, uh, the lawsuit. Uh, quite frankly, uh, it, it's interesting uh, have two lawyers. Uh, it's an unusual type of case. It's the type of case that we typically don't get in metropolitan court. And so uh, I think I would enjoy actually listening to uh, the evidence and the arguments. But I think in the, whatever the final result happened to be, uh, I'm not sure either of you are going to get the full relief that you'd like. Uh, and I'm not sure that, you know, you all want to go through this entire process, go through the expense and the time uh, to present all of the evidence when all of this can be done in the district court and you would get the full relief, and you would get the record. Uh, you would then have a place, uh, perhaps, to file lawsuits or not to file lawsuits. You would know uh, whether or not state courts are the appropriate place within which to uh, conduct uh, this type of litigation. I think it's pretty clear from the uh, Visual Arts Rights Act that federal court is a proper jurisdiction, is a proper place. Uh, is a proper venue to to pursue any kind of federal litigation. Now, maybe the amount in controversy uh, doesn't rise to the limit of their jurisdictional requirements, and maybe that's where you're at right now, and that's why you're not in federal court. Maybe there's some other obstacles like the filing fee or, or things like that. Uh, I understand those kinds of concerns because of metropolitan court, we deal with them all the time. But clearly, federal court would have the authority to hear these kinds of cases. Uh, I'm still uncertain, 
and I'll give each of you the opportunity to make an argument whether or not this court does have the jurisdiction uh, if there is some sort of requirement that any type of dispute related to uh, these types of issues has to be brought pursuant to the Visual Arts Rights Act or if uh, there are any kind of private remedies uh, aside from uh, the enforcement of that act that allows you to file in state courts and then in a small claims court in a, in a court of limited jurisdiction. <coughs> but the, the only issue I have to resolve today is whether or not uh, Mr. Sullivan has standing. He appears to have standing based on the allegation that uh, the owner of the building allowed him to paint the building. Uh, he appears to have standing because there is at least a federal statute in place that tends to protect or provide some sort of protection for uh, these types of works. I'm not ruling that I have jurisdiction. I'm not ruling that this is still the most appropriate place. I know that there are some legal authorities out there that say that if you cannot get full relief from one court, that you shouldn't be wasting the court's time and go to the right court uh, because there are issues with regard to judicial economy too. But certainly interesting. Uh, so I'm going to deny the motion to dismiss uh, and then uh, we'll let you all kind of proceed forward uh, to see what ultimately happens. And who knows, you know, at the end of this, this might be the, uh, I'm not going to call it a landmark decision, uh, but it might be a uh, helpful uh, this defining decision as to whether or not parties in your situation have you know, any rights or what those rights happen to be. So uh, the motion to dismiss is denied. Is there anything else that we can take care of today, Mr. Sullivan? Um, just at the last setting, uh, when we did the telephonic appearance for Mr. Comito, um, the court had made a, an order that um, exhibits witness list needed to be disclosed within 15 days. Um, the defense hasn't, and you weren't there, but they haven't disclosed anything yet. Well, I would just propose to schedule a trial, and, and everybody from this day forward will have time to get ready for trial. I can't imagine that there's a lot of factual disputes. Uh, perhaps there are. Uh, you know, I, I, I've heard. Uh, you know, brief argument. Uh, so uh, I assume that there's not going to be an awful lot of factual dispute. I assume that most of the disputes in this particular case are going to be related to whatever the law is, whatever authority or jurisdiction we have, which is all legal based, uh, law based. So uh, you all will have the opportunity to file a witness list and exhibit lists with each other. All that information has to be exchanged within the next 15 days. And uh, we can give you a trial date right now, actually. How about Well, let me ask you, Mr. Sullivan, first, how many witnesses do you actually call? Uh, just me, Judge. Just yourself. Mr. Krepper? Uh It would be, I'm imagining it would be Mr. Galindo and the property owner, Milton Baca. I don't suspect it will be all any others. Uh, uh, unless we need a rebuttal for expert testimony if Mr. Sullivan is proffering himself as an expert then we might need some sort of graffiti expert to, to rebut his testimony. So you all get to prepare however you like. Uh, I assume that when he gives you his witness list, he'll identify himself as a lay witness, an expert witness, or both. And if he does, at some point, if you need to amend your witness list, I allow that freely, so long as it's done with a reasonable period of time prior to the trial, which it means enough time to conduct 
uh, some sort of inquiry or investigation into whatever experts are going to be called. Um, so, how about Tuesday, April the 7th at 1 30 judge? Yeah. Okay. This is for this is for the actual trial setting, Your Honor. But this is gonna be the trial setting. That works for me, Your Honor. 1 30 p.m. Mr. Sullivan, does that work for you? Yeah, I have uh, Tuesday, April 7th at 1.30. Yes, sir. All right. Is there anything else we can take care of today, then? No, you're right. All right. Thank you. If you'll step up here and see my clerk. She'll give you the order. The motion you just...